Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, so today, we're going to be talking to you about writing loop optimizations in LLVM. Uh, my name is Kit Barton. I work at the IBM lab in Canada. And I'm here with uh, Michael Cruz from Argonne National Labs and Ettore Tioto from, also from IBM Canada. So a uh, brief outline of what we're going to walk through today. Uh, I'm going to take you through some, some of the terminology that you'll run into when you're writing a loop optimization. Um, and some of the kind of the more um, common forms of loops that you're going to want to be familiar with when you're writing loop optimizations. And then uh, Mike's going to come up and talk to you a little bit more about the LC SSA form, the loop closed SSA form, and, uh, and then walk you through a lot of the loop optimizations that already exist in LLVM and talk about their current state. There's uh, several loop optimizations already there. Not all of them are enabled by default, and so Mike's going to walk through some of that. And then Etcher is going to come up and give a demo on uh, writing a simple loop pass. So we've got a loop pass written, a very simple one. He's going to walk you through uh, some of the different steps in writing a pass. And um, so you can see, see that. And then finally, he'll talk about some of the ongoing work that we're doing uh, for loop optimizations. So um, to start with, uh, the loop representation that you will see in LLVM, we have uh, several different um, kind of terminologies or parts of the loop that we that we identify. So this is an example here. I've got the example in the, in the top right, the in C, and this is basically a view CFG that you would get when you dump the uh, LLVM IR and and run the view CFG pass. So first thing, um, we have the preheader of the loop, which is a block that's not considered part of the loop. It's outside the loop, but it dominates uh, the header block. Uh, then you have the header um, down here which is going to be the single entry point for the loop, and it's going to dominate all of the other blocks that are inside of the loop. Um, we have the exiting and the exit blocks. Um, so the exiting blocks are the blocks that are inside of the loop that branch outside of the loop, and the exit blocks are the blocks outside of the loop that are branched to by blocks in the loop. Um, and so these are all uh, blocks um, that you can get through the various APIs that are provided in the, the loop classes. Uh, just a small note, the APIs, there are, there's two forms of the APIs. There's a git exit block and a git exit blocks and a git exiting block and a git exiting blocks. Um, so basically one's the plural form of the other. And the, the way those interfaces work is if there's a single exiting block, and a single exit block, then the non-plural forms return um, that block, and the plural forms will return null. And if you've got multiple exiting blocks or multiple exit blocks, the plurals, plural form of the API gives you the, the list of the blocks that you're after. And if there's just a single one, then that will, give, that will give you null. So it's a way that you can tell easily whether or not your loops have either a single exit or exiting block or a single or, or multiple exit or exiting blocks. And then uh, last, you have the latch, which is the block that contains the branch back up to the loop header. Okay. So these are the, the common parts of the loop that you will often um, use and refer to when you're doing loop optimizations. So there's a lot of other terminology that we use when we're doing loop optimizations. I'm not going to walk through um, the definitions of all of these, because that probably gets pretty boring pretty quick. Um, one of the things that, that we started doing, um, I guess, it, during the summer sometime, we've uh, created a, a doc on the, on the LLVM docs website um, that starts to list all of the different terminology that we use in the loop optimizations and loop passes and try to flush out those, uh, those terms and, and provide some concrete definitions to them. So this is very much a work in progress. Um, it's, the document has been started. You've got a lot of the terminology covered there, but it certainly there's, there's things that are not there. So if anybody is, is reading through and you see things that are obviously missing, um, you know, patches are welcome. Any, any types of improvements that we can make to the documentation are certainly welcome. But this is the starting point for people who want, who are looking at, at loop passes in, in terms of understanding the, the terminology that we use. Um, now, there's two other things that I want to uh, go through before I hand it over to Michael. And um, 
things that you'll run into often when you're writing loop optimizations, two concepts. One is for rotated loops, and the other one is simplified form. So there are a lot of loop optimizations um, that require loops to be rotated. And so what that does is loop rotation will convert uh, a loop into a do while style loop. So um, you have this example here of a, of a for loop that goes from zero to 100. Um, the original form you see here, so you've got the condition, um, the latch condition uh, at the top, and then it, or sorry, the header, which branches into the body of the loop, and then the latch, um, is all, which is also the header, goes back, or, which is also the body, goes back to the header, and then checks um, whether or not your exit condition is satisfied. So when we rotate this, um, we, we change it into, like I said, into a do while style loop. So we do execute the body um, at least once. And then at the end of the loop, we check the exiting condition and then branch back to the beginning if there's more iterations required. So this is a preferred uh, form for many loop optimizations because it simplifies the loop. Um, it, it puts it in a more canonical form and it's, it, oftentimes it's easier to reason about the loop. Um, because you have it in a very, um, in a consistent form. All rotated loops will be in a consistent form. Uh, one of the downsides uh, to rotated loops is if the, if the compiler can prove that the loop body is gonna execute at least once, um, it can put it into, into this form where you're gonna execute the body once and then check the exit condition at the end. If it can't prove that it's going to execute at least once, it needs to ex er, insert a guard. So in this example, we've got um, the upper bound of the loop is, is coming in as a parameter to the function. So uh, in this case, the compiler can't tell whether or not the loop is going to execute at least once because it's possible that n is going to be either 0 or, or negative, in which case it needs to execute a guard, um, which you'll see here. Um, oops. Um, it puts this uh, a guard check in here at the beginning to check whether or not you actually want to get into the loop body. And um, the, I, I mention this because there are loop optimizations that are sensitive to this because the presence are, of the guard can, changes the control flow around the loop and, um, and it may or may not affect what you want to do in the loop optimization itself. So we've recently added some infrastructure uh, into some of the, the loop um, uh, classes that allow you to test whether a loop is guarded or not, and then that will allow you to do, do things slightly differently if you are, have a guarded loop or a non-guarded loop. All right, and then last thing I wanted to cover is the simplified form. So this is also a precondition for a lot of loop optimizations um, because, again, it allows you to uh, assume certain properties of the loop. So it will guarantee that the loop has a preheader. Um, it guarantees that it has a latch and that it has these dedicated exits. And again, the idea is uh, if you know it's in simplified form, then you know you can assume that these, these various uh, parts of the loop exist. Uh, they can be empty, so it's oftentimes it's common to see the, uh, the pre-header of the loop will be empty, which we've seen in, in the previous examples. Um, there's nothing in it, but the fact that it's there is very, very useful, and you can, you can use that. Um, you do need to be a little bit careful because there are other cleanup passes that you can run afterwards that will remove these empty blocks. So Simplify CFG will go through, and it will remove a pre-header if the pre-header is empty. But so one of the things that you'll do when you do your, your loop pass is you make the simplified form a required uh, analysis and then that will go through and make sure that you've got these, these blocks and it will create the blocks for you if, if they're not already there in the loop. Okay, now I'm going to hand it over to Mike and he's going to go through. Another form of uh, normalized loop form is the loop closed SSA. So I'm going to assume you, you know what uh, a st single static assignment is. And this example is one case of it. You see a use somewhere after the, uh, the loop for some dot next. And it's perfectly valid. So the, uh, the loop dominates the, the exit block, so it can, it can use it uh, by the rules. And the loop closed SSA form would now introduce another um, instruction here in the exit block. 
another phi, uh, which just one single uh, entry, which is usually not used, uh, but is part of the loop closed SSA form. So you would also change every single use of the sum.next to the sum result, which is after the use. So why to do it? So uh, or first, uh, what the workflow? So there's a LC SSA pass which will um, convert every your your um, bit code into LC SSA form. So it will add these finals with just a single single entry. And if you have a loop pass, you must also preserve it, which is one of the invariants of the loop pass manager. And when you execute the ins combined pass, it will be removed again, so it, it disappears again. So it's a, it's a uh, temporary reform. So the advantages of it is um, if you make changes within the loop, um, which changes the result of, of the loop, you would only need to change or the, the replace all uses with. It would only change the use, the only use after the loop would be the uh, LC SSA phi instruction. And everything else is, um, is unaffected. This could have been theoretical and an advantage if you would run multiple loop passes in, in parallel, so they would not interfere uh, with each other, which uh, the same framework does not support and in foreseeable future will, will, uh, will not support. Uh, the other advantage is that um, uh, for the use of Scala evolution, usually when you want to get a Scala evolution expression, you need to pass in the instructions for which you want to have a closed form uh, expression for and also the scope. And the scope determines whether the, the uh, scalar evolution expression is e evaluated within the loop, in which case you can reference the, uh, the, uh, the induction variable in the form of a um, uh, recur uh, at rec expression. Um, and, but if you are after the loop, it might simplify the form. So it can, if scalar evolution is able to determine how often the uh, the loop is executed, it might replace this, uh, this expression by um, a constant expression, but which is only valid after the loop has executed, but because after the loop, the value is now. If you have LCSSA form, then you don't need to pass the scope because that um, simplifies it. If you are within the loop, you would only pass the, the instruction within the loop. Outside of the loop, you would um, pass the LCSSA node, so there's no ambiguity within with the scope there. So um, LCSSA is, is one part of the, the infrastructure provided by, uh, by LLVM. Here I listed some other classes um, useful if you're writing um, um, a loop pass. Um, I'm not going to explain all of them, just highlight the most important one, which is first loop info or in the form of loop analysis as uh, um, for the loop pass manager, which just uh, determines what are the natural loops in the program. Uh, we have the loop simplify pass, which ensures the normal form there that kids explained already, and there's the loop closed SSA form. So, these three passes are implicitly added by the loop pass manager whenever, uh, whenever uh, uh, your loop pass is executed. So you can actually assume that your uh, loop uh, is in, has this normal form. So um, apart from infrastructure, there are actually also loop transformation passes inside the LLVM framework. They are quite pl plentiful, but uh, not all of them are, are enabled by default or usable. So uh, the ones that are actually enabled by default in, um, uh, in the past pipeline, so if you compile with dash 03, you get some of uh, these passes. Um, uh, I'm also again not explaining all of them, just um, look them at what, uh, what they are doing. So just keep in mind that uh, by default, you don't get um, a loop predication pass or something, although there is a pass. So if you like uh, your pass have something 
uh, to be run before you loop paths. You can may want to look up other paths, especially for instance, if you don't uh, cannot have your path has trouble with irreducible control flow. There are actually paths which uh, transform uh, irreducible control flow into natural loops. So the structure in the, the path manager is as follows. We actually have, you might know, two path managers. I'm mostly concentrating on the new path manager. For reference, I also have the old or legacy path manager next, next to it, which is structured somewhat differently, especially regarding uh, loop passes. So uh, on the right, the right one, you see the new path, uh, path manager, which um, um, has the flow from the yeah from the clang generated the IR generated from uh, clang at the top and going through the pass up until the the back end at the bottom. So this is simplified. Of course, this does not contain everything, but you uh, what I want to focus on is there are actually two loop pass managers in in there. So um, uh, these the loop pass managers. Uh, execute loop passes and have a collection of passes with they execute. Um, some passes in there are only enabled by switches, so they are actually not by the uh, dash 03 pipeline by default, but you can enable it with some uh, internal switches. And at the moment, this is an unroll and jam pass. Um, you have passes which are added but don't do anything by default, which is for the case for loop distribute. And also, if you pass like F no loop unrolling to, to Clang, it will also disable loop unrolling or, or loop vectorize if you pass uh, dash F no vectorize. But it's still in the pass pipeline. It just passed the flag to only um, uh, consider part mass and do not by itself do some transformation uh, depending on some probability heuristic. You can, there's something called callbacks in there. So you can, uh, from an external pass, add in your own passes in, inside the default pipeline. Uh, so there are two endpoints there at the moment for loop passes, and Poly uses, for instance, one of them. And of course, there are a lot of passes never added to the pipeline builder in the, uh, as listed before. There are also differences in the legacy pipeline. So for instance, loop interchange. Um, can be added by a uh, switch to the or loop uh, reroll can is in the legacy path manager default pipeline, but not in the new path manager default pipeline. So keep this in mind that these these are differences. So the the um, order of the transformation of, of course also follows the order in the path pipeline, meaning in this structure you cannot do an un, uh, um, a loop distribution after vectorization. You have to do uh, the, the loop distribution is always before the loop vectorization. In this case, it makes a lot of sense because the loop distributes pass was designed to make, uh, to enable loop vectorization. There's some exception in there inside the loop manager. If you are a pass inside the loop manager, you can tell the loop pass manager to tell you, I modified this loop, it will put it back in the work list and execute the passes on it again. So this allows you to do some uh, loop transformations until you reach the, the fixed point. Um, what I also not shown here in bit, uh, on this graph is there are passes in between which are not loop passes, like there's GVN, ins combine, and so on, uh, in between which make sometimes make um, loop transformations are more difficult depending on what you actually want to do with that one. So, and you may notice I listed uh, some paths at the bottom which actually I consider to be loop passes, but for the path manager are function passes, not loop passes. Once the loop vectorize is one of the examples. It's, it's a, a pass that runs on, on function and implements the loop, the uh, loop, um, uh, related stuff by itself, so it uh, iterates over all the, the loops, ensures by itself that it's in simplify in LCSSA form and processes the loop until there's uh, nothing more to do. So for recommendation, I generally would, that's my personal recommendation, might be some, some biases, <laughs> when you consider writing a loop transformation to first consider do it 
uh, write it as a function pass. Uh, the reasons are that the, the function pass manager, it's a lot more used than the loop one pass manager, so you should, should pro uh, probably get run into fewer problems. You don't need to initialize the loop pass manager and the new pass manager, and you need to in, uh, specifically explicitly construct a loop pass manager and add it to the pass pipeline, something that the legacy pass manager did by itself. So if you have a function pass, actually you don't need to do it. There's actually a proxy where you could actually add, uh, um, um, could add a loop pass into a function pass manager as well. Uh, there's fewer requirements, so the loop pass manager requires you to preserve yeah, for instance, the, the loop analysis, because it's, it's based on the loop analysis, if you break the loop analysis, the loop pass manager itself will break, including some, some other stuff. And you have, as shown by the loop vector as pass, more control about the order in which you execute your transformation or analysis over the, um, uh, over the loop, uh, loop nest. But if you need to write a loop pass, in, in, in some cases, so if you want to have multiple transformations applied to, um, to the same loop, uh, instead of uh, do all the loops on pass one, then do all the loops on pass two, do instead loop one, pass one, pass two, loop two, pass one, two, uh, pass two, then you, you would need uh, um, the loop pass manager. You also would need it if you want to have this behavior of uh, re-updating the loop, uh, loop pass manager, the, the loop nest, and want to rerun other loop passes. Uh, if you want to add into the endpoint callbacks, then of course you need to be, uh, have to write a loop pass. And uh, if you write an analysis used by other loop passes, it's also useful to be also be a loop uh, analysis. So, thank you. So that's my part. So Hector is now going to um, show you how to write an actual loop pass, if you decide to write a loop pass. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Um, so, um, like we said before, we're gonna have, uh, this is gonna be uh, a demo. So we have created like um, a basic loop optimization or loop transformation pass. Uh, the goal of the optimization is to uh, present the steps that one goes about to write any kind of new pass. Um, we have divided the tutorial into five steps and we have uploaded on GitHub um, all, all, all the code that we're gonna show you today. So you can go and uh, clone the repository, which is for from the LLVM repository, and then try to repeat the same steps uh, and try to learn how things work. So uh, the first step will be, so the goal of the optimization is gonna be to try to uh, identify some loops and then uh, try to split the loop into two portions. So if the loop of the iteration space is like from zero to 100, for example, we're gonna try to split the loop into half and then a first loop that traverse half of, the first half of the iteration space, and then the second loop is going to traverse the second half of the iteration space. Uh, first step is going to talk about um, how to create an infrastructure that um, basically set up the, the, the loop pass, and this is going to be common for, for a lot of things that you want to do. Okay, so this is uh, the, the project, and I'm going to show you quickly, I'm going to go through the code, and then we're going to um, run some tests to see how things get printed out, how to debug a pass, and so on. So there are seven files in this um, pull request, which is uh, introduced the, the new pass. The first, the header. Uh, things to observe for the header is that it, this is, uh, contains two classes. Uh, the class that is gonna do all the work for you called loop split. That's gonna be your um, uh, workhorse, your optimization. He has a run method that is gonna be called and then uh, it's gonna be given a loop and the loop, uh, the loop is going to be split and it's going to return whether the transformation is successful or there was nothing to do by turn, returning true or false. And then the, the actual loop transformation pass, which uh, is uh, always in from a pass info mixing. This is in the new pass manager. 
and he has a run method which receives a loop and then also the a loop analysis manager. You're going to use the loop analysis manager to request uh, analysis that you need to do your your transformation, and um, you know you as other other uh, objects that are passed in. There is a um, when you have a, a new pass, you you want to register with the pass manager. You do this in the pass builder. So here we are adding our new loop or tutorial pass to the loop pass manager. That's going to be the second pass manager that uh, Michael showed you before. So you're going to insert it there, and it's going to run at a point. You're going to register the loop pass. So the loop pass is going to be you, you're going to be able to invoke it by calling the name loop hop tutorial. And I'll show you how to do that in the in the test. Compile the the code, and this is your C++ file, which initially it doesn't do much. It just uh, uh, verify that the run method is called, uh, and we're going to print out a couple of traces uh, through the LLVM debug info, and just print out which loop is is actually uh, passed in into the into the transformation. You want it bigger? Sure. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and we're going to create our own class, pass. Uh, so, because we receive this loop standard analysis results, it's going to have a loop info. It contains, it's a data structure that contains the dominator tree, it contains the loop uh, uh, info results, and, and, and other things. So. Because we're going to need a loop info, we're just going to initialize our our uh, loop uh, transformation and cache can get a reference to that, and then call the run method, pass the loop, and the run method doesn't really do anything other than uh, printing that we're done with this step, and we're going to move to the next step. Okay, uh, every one of these uh, steps is going to come with. Um, uh, a lead test. In this case, the lead test is going to, um, you know, we have a function. The function contains two loops. Here is the first loop, and then we're going to have another loop down over there. Um, so we expect to receive, to print out two loops. Then we're going to you know, receive the first loop and then the second loop. And this is not, these are not nested loop. Okay, so. Let's uh, try to run this. Uh, for simplicity, I have a run script that is going to get that simple LL file and essentially show that our print method is, uh, is, uh, is called. And you know, it prints that we found a loop at depth one. That's a, a top level loop. Uh, that this is the, um, the loop structure. So the header is basic block file is also the exiting block of the loop. The latch is basic block 14, uh, and and we get our to do. So that's the first loop, and then this one is the second loop in 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 the IR. So so far so good. This means our transformation is being invoked correctly and is able to process the the loop and print them out, but it doesn't do anything yet. So the next step, uh, for the next step, we're going to try to um, set up things so that we are receiving loops and we want to check whether the loops are, are in a canonical form. And if they are not in a canonical form for any reason, then we're going to bail out. We're going to filter them out. They are not candidate for our transformation. If they're not rotated, well, they're not kind. So there is usually a transformation as a set of uh, initial requirement that you, you don't care about certain type of loops because uh, you're not prepared to handle them, and so you're going to filter them out, and then you're left with a number of loops that you do care about and you want to do something about. So that will be what's presented in this uh, part of the of the tutorial. So the diff here shows. Uh, that we have added into the loop split class, we have added a, a new member function, a private member function that receives a loop and simply determines whether the loop is a candidate for the, our transformation, nothing complicated. And then in the implementation file, we have this um, 
candidate function. The candidate function is going to check whether the loop is in a simplified form. That's like the canonical form that we're looking for. If it is not, it's simply going to return false and, and do nothing. Because our transformation is going to take a loop and clone it and create a duplicate of the loop, uh, then we're also going to call this function that is going to tell us whether the loop is safe to clone. And if it's not safe to clone, we, we cannot clone it, and so we're, we're not going to do anything. And, and so on, which we're going to check some, some condition. Another thing is kind of like an artificial condition as an example. We're only interested in transforming innermost loop into a loop, in, into a loop nest. So if we find a loop that is not in the innermost position in, into a nest, we're going to filter it out. And um, um, so let's see this uh, part in action. I'm going to go to the second part of the tutorial. And then just uh, uh, let's take a look at the simple.ll. So here again, we have, we have um, a loop. So, uh, we have two loops. So these are our candidates. So which, because they, they are not outermost loops. So when we run it, we should say that, OK, we have collected our loop. Here is a loop called B5. B5 is the name of the header of that loop. It is a candidate. It passed all the, all the checks. So it's, not, it's, it's in canonical form and all, all the other condition. And so we found another one. I have another test here, which is a, represent a, a nest, loop test. Um, in, for this test, we expect the loop J, the innermost loop into the nest, to be a candidate, but loop I we should not be a candidate because we put that condition that we are only able to uh, end the loops that don't have any subloops or they don't have any children. So um, I should be filtered out. And if we run it, uh, we should get the, um, the message that the innermost loop so the pass manager is going to handle the innermost loop first, and then it's going to walk out from innermost to the outermost. The first loop that gets called is the innermost loop. He is a candidate. And then the second loop, uh, which is this guy over here, is not a candidate because it's not an innermost loop, and so we, we are able to catch it. In your transformation, you may want to do something like that. You may want to uh, create a class that represents a candidate loop. You may want to check that the loop is, uh, you know, it doesn't have loop carry dependence, all kinds of sort of things. So the recommendation here is to try to do it early in your pass and throw away things that may cause an error condition later on. At the end of the tutorial, I have an example where uh, it's interesting to know that your transformation doesn't do something on certain loops. So there are facility in, in LLVM to admit reports. Um, and we'll see how they work to meet statistics. We'll see how they, they help. Because you may uh, process some LLVM IR code, and you, know, you want to know how many loops are, are end or how, how many loops you, you are just simply skipping. We'll see that later. So now is the part, the, the, the most, you know, the, the, now that we have filtered out all the, all the loops that we don't care about, we're going to start to do the real work, the real work to actually generate the code to, to do the transformation, to split the loop. So that's uh, in uh, this pull request. And so what we're going to do, like I said before, we're going to collect a candidate loop and then go and clone it. So um, what we have here, we have a, a number of new member functions that um, the, this member function split loop in half is essentially what's going to do the work on the loop. Uh, a very important one is uh, this one. It clones the loop. So given a loop and given a split point, you're going to clone it and then modify the bounds of the loop. So compute split point is going to inject the code to find out uh, where you want to split the loop, at which point in the iteration space, and then um, the clone loop is, is going to clone loop and change the bounds. The implementation is uh, over here. Uh, so when we call the run method, first we check if the loop is a candidate. If it is a candidate, we continue. Otherwise, we, 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 we return. And then we call split loop enough. And split loop enough uh, will add some asserts. That's also a good practice to have. Like just because you 
you, you, fil you filter loops that you don't care about, so you should assert that you're not getting anything that you don't, you're not prepared to handle. So that's always good to put some, some assert at the beginning of your, um, of your function to guarantee that you are in the same conditions. And then, first thing that we do, we're going to compute the split point, and I'm going to show you what that function does. To compute the split point, um, we're going to get the bounds of the loop. This is a new routine that we added recently to get the bounds of, of, of a loop. This is going to give you the initial value of the induction variable, which is the lower bound of the loop. We're going to get the final value, so the upper bound of the loop, and just simply going to compute we're going to generate a computation to divide it in half. And we don't care about remainders or all of the stuff. So we're just going to inject that computation somewhere in the, in the we're going to inject it at, very, at the very beginning of the creator of the first loop. So we're going to have that. That's the first step. So now that we have the insertion point and we have generated the, the code to compute the split point, we're going to take that loop and clone it. And to clone it, Usually, you would call a loop utility. We have a loop utility that uh, will do the cloning of a loop for you, very useful. It's also going to update all the data structure like Dominator 3, uh, the loop info for you. is going to keep everything in, in good shape. But for, um, I'm not going to do that because this is an example. I'm going to create my own, my clone loop with Preheader. And that routine is going to do everything that the original LLVM routine does except it will not update the dominator tree. Because I want to show you that if you do not update the dominator tree, you're going to get into trouble. And um, you know, you, when you try to verify that the dominator tree is up to date, you're going to crash. Right? So that's, that's um, the thing. So again, I'm, I don't have the time to go through all of this, but this routine will essentially take your loop and make a copy. And after you're done with the copy, um, you are going to need to remap the instructions in the clone version of the loop. Uh, the, the cloner will take the uh, instruction in each basic block inside the loop and simply make a copy. But it will, and, and the instruction will continue to reference the old value. So uh, you need to remap them in, so that they, if I use inside the loop, is going to refer to the definition of that variable in the same loop and not in the original loop. This is what remap instruction in block does. This is also something that you have to do if you use the regular uh, clone loop with preheader functions, which gives you a map when you clone, which contains the mapping between the basic blocks in the original loop and the basic blocks in the clone loop. Um, and uh, last, we're going to we're going to have to uh, make the predecessor so the block that comes before the original loop now jump to the clone loop. And then the clone loop is going to jump to the, to the original loop. OK? So let's take a look at how, how that works and see what happens to the IR when you, when you do that. I'm going to go from step two to step three. And So this is what's going to happen. We have um, only a loop in, in this case. And we expect to generate two loops. And this is what these checks are, are checking for. They're checking that you have a new loop. And then we expect the, the upper bound and the lower bound of this loop to be modified. That's what they check. Like, I forgot to tell you that. Uh, because we're using the new pass manager, the way to invoke your pass is through this command line option called passes equal. And you have to put the short name, the identifier of your loop transformation. So ours is called loop dash op dash torio. You're going to put that. And if you require the loop to be rotated, you also have to put the rotation transformation before the loop op tutorial or uh, you're going to get into the transformation and bail out immediately because these loops in the IR are not rotating manually. Uh, we're going to call it and see what happened to the loop as we debug it. So just this is what I'm doing with this RAM script. I'm essentially uh, running 
the IR file that I'm going to pass in, and I'm going to be debugging it. So I'm going to print this LLVM debug information that I scatter throughout the code to understand what's going on. And here it is. So we're going to start with the simple nest. We have our, have our original loop, which is being rotated at this point. And uh, um, so you can see that there is only one loop is being rotated because the latch is at the end and goes back to the, to the header. Uh, you can see that we have actually inserted the insertion point the, the code to compute the split point has been inserted here in the predecessor of the original loop. So we're taking the loop bounds are 0 to 100. So we're going to split it in half, and this computation is going to give you 50. If these were symbolic bounds, this should still work. Uh, and then we clone the loop. So after the loop has been cloned, you can see that there are two loops, the original loop down at the bottom and the new clone loop over here. Um, notice that the bounds are not yet being updated. So the, the first loop starts from zero and it goes to 100. It should go to 50 because that's our split point, but we have not changed the, the code yet. And, and, and the second loop is also going to go from zero to 100. Um, the instructions have not been remapped yet. So that's the next step and you can Look at the difference between this step and the other to see what happened when instructions are remapped. And uh, um, after we finally are done updating the bounds, the first loop is now going from zero to percent one. Percent one is that value, that 50 in this case that we computed, so that split point. So we traverse after the iteration space in the first loop. And then uh, when the loop ends, it's gonna go to the entry split point, we jumps to body. The second loop is now starting from that iteration point and going all the way up to the original upper bound, 100. That's our uh, transformation. The AR looks good, at least to me. Are we done? No, we're not done because uh, we need to check if this works for a loop nest. So we run the same thing on a loop nest uh, you see that this is actually a, a loop that has a high and J. So it's a, I, 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 the, the I loop is the outermost loop and J is the innermost loop. The transformation tries to do its thing and then it crashes. And here is this trace back that you're going to get. And as soon as you see something like dominator three, something that your clue to know that the dominator tree, the transformation did something to this loop, but it failed to update the dominator tree, and that caused an assertion somewhere else into uh, the, uh, you know, in, inside the uh, compiler. So how to fix it? The next step would be, okay, let's go and learn how to, what we need to do to keep the dominator tree up to date. Michael before uh, mentioned that, um, if you add a function pass, you don't have to worry too much about uh, updating these data structures because they will be invalidated and then you know uh, uh, you, you basically run again. Uh, but if you have a loop pass, you're responsible for the, keeping this data structure up to date yourself. And that's for various reasons. One important reason is to save compile time so that you know you're also gonna be able to uh, you know, if you update the dominator, if you modify the dominator tree, you are not modifying the dominator tree for everything. You are only going to keep, uh, you know, remove some edges and add some nodes and keep it up to date. So that's what uh, this patch does. The difference is um, that uh, we want to update the dominator tree. So um, we are going to create a list, or actually a small vector, of Dominator three updates, uh, and you know we cache. We, we expect to have a few of them. Eight. Uh, the update type is going to tell us whether we want to remove a hedge or add a hedge, and so on. And then uh, we're going to, when we clone the loop, we're going to pass the three, that list that we created into the um, routine my clone loop we created, which is going to uh, keep it up to date and give it back to us when it returns. There is some code over here to show 
to traverse all the three updates and then just print them out to see what, what that code did. Um, and then finally, uh, we create a dominator three updater object. Uh, we set up that the update stra strategy is lazy. There are two update strategies. One is lazy and, and eager. So my understanding is like in lazy, you're gonna get a bunch of edges and then apply, try to, to apply all these uh, uh, changes in one block. Uh, eager, you're gonna do the changes as soon as you get them, right? So if you get a list of three or four changes, you're gonna do the first one immediately. Um, and then, you know, you apply the update and you flush the dominator tree, so you manifest the changes into the, um, into the data structures. So the real code that does the update is inside the uh, my clone loop with pre-header, and there it is. Um, you, can, you can read what it does. Essentially what you need to do is to think about your dominator tree and then reconnect the edges. Uh, things have been changed because the predecessor of the original loop is now flowing into the clone loop, no longer flowing into the original loop. So you're gonna have to add that edge and then remove the other one. So you are going to uh, add all your update into this three updater, and then uh, this data structure is gonna contain all, all your update, but they have not been done yet. They're all gonna be uh, applied when you, um, like I said before, you apply them, you apply the updates. So let's see how that works. Again, so for the simple loop, if I look for some traces, I can see that that code has been executed and then there are some edges from this basic block to that basic block and from that basic block to this basic block that are had it, and so this is nice because if I look at if I can, if I print out the dominator tree, and I see what should be changed, I can I can debug it easily. So I recommend that you you do sort something like this. You print them out and kind of like uh, with a pen and a graph, you ensure that that's correct and that's what you want. Okay, so that's nice. You can do it this way, but uh, the other way to do it is to really make sure whether the updates are correct. Um, you can always verify them. So for, if I am in a debug build, I like to verify that my dominator tree is sane and correct. So this call will assert if the dominator tree is not correct. And it will recompute the dominator tree and compare it to the one that you have. If they are not identical, then um, it will assert. So that's how you know that you have done your work correctly and everything looks, uh, looks fine. So with that, we should be able to now run the old code, the, the other code that was uh, not working before and the assert is gone. And I can show you inside here that in fact, we have split the innermost loop in the nest into, uh, in, into two loops. So there is a 2J body. This one starts at zero and goes up to percent one, and where percent one is actually computed over here. So it's 50, so that's the first uh, part of the, the first loop, and then the second loop is going is gonna go from one to 100. And it still contain, these two loops are now contained inside the outermost loop. Any question on this so far? No? Okay, so the last thing that you were gonna show you is uh, how to use the statistic and optimization remarks emitter to report failures and successes in your transformation. So that's the goal is essentially to know when your transformation fails and how many times uh, it runs correctly for any given piece of IR. So we need two classes. That's the statistic class and the optimization remark class. Um, and uh, this will be, uh, the optimization remark pass will be given to us by 
the loop transformation. So here is how you add statistics. So I'm going to have a few statistics to report that the loop has not been splitted or it failed because it's not in simplified form and so on. Remember when we added the candidate before we were just returning false. And now we are able to report that we found an invalid candidate and it's not in simplified form. So the statistics go into a meta message and then we will, it's going to add a counter for every time that you encounter that condition. And you can write diagnostic, te diagnostic test to verify that everything works as you expect it to do. This code here is, um, is essentially emitting an optimization remark. So that's an, another, there are different type of optimization remark. You can report analysis failure. So if you, for example, you are trying to look for something that is um, um, a loop that is in normalized form and you don't find it, you can report that your analysis failed. And so uh, you would use this type of remarks analysis. Uh, for example, yeah, we say loop is not kind for splitting because of a certain, certain condition happened. And you can also report successes. So if your pass modify the code, you should not be using the optimization remark analysis, but you should be reporting with just an optimization remark it's to distinguish between the two. And uh, what else? So here is an is a interesting thing. So because the optimization remark emitter is itself, a, it's an analysis, but it's a function analysis, your pass will not be able to uh, requirely without doing something special because a loop can only require uh, loop analysis. The optimization remark and meter analysis is a function analysis. So for you to get your hands on it, you're going to have to create what we call a proxy. So you're going to create your proxies in this way and then uh, try to get the uh, ORI, the optimization result analysis analysis, but you may get now. So we check for now and we report or something did happen. When you may get now because that, that, that particular analysis didn't run yet. So that's something that uh, it's unfortunate about the, the loop passes. Loop passes cannot really use uh, functional analysis in a reliable way. So as we run this piece of code, we're going to look at what the analysis are. Get to five and then run our loop nest, and this is going to tell me, oh, OK, oh, I found a loop. Uh, we don't have the coordinates, so the loop was inside a routine called that free. It has been splitted. Uh, if I had the correct source coordinates, it will tell me exactly where the loop was in the, in the source file. And then the, we will report that that transformation ran successfully uh, one <coughs> time, and one time uh, it, it wasn't able to to split the loop because it was not a inner model. So that's how this stuff works, all right? Um, one thing that you also need to do, like I say, the optimization remark analysis uh, is an uh, analysis, so you need to require it. So if you want to write your test, you're going to require that analysis to run before your loop pass or things are not going to work because you're going to get an outpoint. So that concludes the, um, the demo. And uh, my last thing is to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing uh, in, the, in the loop optimizations. Um, so we're working on trying to create uh, what we call, what are called in the literature, data dependence graph and program dependence graph. So these ideas are not new. They've been around since the early 80s. Um, and essentially, we're trying to rebuild inside the LLVM uh, infrastructure the idea of representing dependencies in the form of a, of a data dependencies graph. So there are two flavors of this dependencies graph. Actually, there are three. The first flavor called DDG it represent, is a graph, is a direct graph that represents um, um, data dependencies between um, memory accesses inside a loop. Uh, it does not consider control flow. So if you have control flow inside your loop, the data dependencies graph will be inaccurate because it doesn't take that into account. And um, the difference between the DDG and the PDG is that the PDG or program dependence graph also consider control flow. 
So currently we're working on uh, the first one, the DDG, and we have planned to also extend and introduce the PDG within LLVM. So here's an example of a data dependence graph. Assume that you have a for loop, and uh, the for loop does some memory operation. So we are going to have a load of C, C sub i, here it is. Um, there's going to be a load of B sub i minus 1, the previous iteration value. Um, and then there will be an add. So the node that has an add depends on the results of the, the two loads. So it's going to consume those results. And so there is a hedge in the data dependencies graph between these two loads to their consumer. So th these are def use edges. So it's, it's essentially every use is going to have one definition in uh, SSA form. And we're going to create edges in the data dependence graph to represent that, um, that fact. Um, there is another definition between the store into B and the had. Here it is. And finally, the most interesting one is that there is a, a loop carry dependencies between this store and the load, the load of B sub i. So we are, to compute the, nest, the value in the next iteration, we need the value of B from the previous iteration. So we have a true dependencies, and the dependence distance is one iteration. That's how we represent the graph. So that's all it is. That the data dependencies graph essentially represents the dependencies in your in your program and is limited to loops for now. Um, now uh, the interesting part about this data dependencies graph is, like I told you, that the DDG is acyclic, but it is not in this case um, because there is a cycle between uh, these calls by these edges. So um, in the literature cycles in the DDG are represented by pi blocks. So pi block is essentially a component that represent a number of subcomponents. So the real DDG is going to contain a pi block that contains other nodes that form a cycle. So that's how we deal with um, you know cycle within the DDG. And cycle are important because uh, these nodes cannot be moved to a different loop without breaking, uh, without making an incorrect transformation. All right. Uh, you can read more about this. We have uh, an, a number of pull requests. So, so far, we're working our way through. We have introduced a new utility, called a directed graph, so that, that you can use in general. It's a template that you can use to build any directed graph. DDG is one of them. PDG is another one of them. If you have the need for a directed graph, then you should try to inherit from this class that we've added to uh, LLVM for directed graphs. And we have introduced the basic framework and also uh, continue to put pull requests. We expect this to go well and to be completely finished uh, soon in, and available for everybody to use. After uh, DDG is complete, so that we have, um, we have the entire infrastructure is all code review and upstream, we're going to start to work on the PDG. Uh, and the PDG and the DDG have some common functionality so we're going to leverage some graph builder to build both of them. What are the envisioned consumers for these type of graphs? Uh, any, any transformation that need to reason about data dependencies for, to determine wh whether or not uh, it can be done legally, and a lot of transformation need to do that, well, we're, going to, we're going to use that. So we're going to definitely use, and sorry for the mistake, uh, spelling mistake, uh, loop distribution, which is something that uh, we want to work on and we're working on, is going to uh, use these uh, graphs. Loop few should, could also use the same graph. So I'm saying it here maybe because we may want to have both loop fusion and distribution to use the, the graphs or only one of them or, you know, and have like eager fusion. And then consider using this infrastructure in your own paths and report bugs and help us to make it high quality. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> you showed uh, updating the, the uh, dominator tree, but you didn't show how you'd update the loop info. So the, originally, you had an outer loop with a single inner loop. Now, you, after this, you'd have an outer loop with two inner loops. Yes. How did, how did the loop info get updated? Today? Okay, yeah, so we didn't show the loop info is uh, updating this example. If you look at the clone loop with pre-header, 
we're also going to, another requirement is that you keep the loop info uh, correct. So we have done it inside that function. Essentially, when you create a loop, whether it's in nested or not, you need to register the loop with the loop info. So there is a method to say add this loop to the loop info, and now the loop info knows about the new loop. You have to do that, or um, you have a, a mistake in your code. That's that's not shown in the demo, but is is in the code. Um, just just to mention there, actually, the loop info, if you close the verify, does not check for uh, loops that are, uh, have been added in the IR, but not added to loop info, and just ignore. It ignore doesn't know it. about them. It's, yeah, it doesn't know about it. it. It doesn't check. Like, dominator tree, the verify, recomputes the entire uh, um, uh, dominator tree and compares uh, current state with the recomputed one. And if they mish, mith, mismatch, then it, it, it fails. The loop info just looks at the loops it, it knows and looks whether they're still loops, whether they're still available, uh, and, and nest, have the proper nesting, but not where it totally ignores loops that you are uh, added. So these can be silently be gone. I know this because like poly actually is also adds more loops, and but does not tell the loop in info about it, and so far it has not complained about it. <laughs> it, it was so. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Okay. Questions? Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, okay. There were some other data dependency analysis in the past. I believe it's called memory dependence. Is it going this past to be obsolete? I mean, just curious. Uh, this is based on uh, Rice, uh, Rice University work. I'm just curious. I, mean, I personally use it for other purposes, but what's your comments on that? So there are multiple uh, yeah. analysis passes in there, and having adding uh, a new one does not deprecate the others we already have. So, so the data dependence graph the, is not a new analysis; it's just a way to summarize the information that exists. So we're using the classical framework, again, introduced by uh, Ken Kennedy at uh, Rice University to essentially build the DDG and the, and the PDG. Um, the quality of the result depends on the quality of the analysis that is there in LLVM. Okay. Um, okay, thank, uh, thank our speakers for the talk.